What's up guys? Evan Minton here bringing you another Christian Apologetics video. Today we're going to be talking about the fine-tuning argument for God's existence. Now before I get into it, uh, this is going to be a longer video than my usual videos. So if you're only interested in certain sections <clears throat> of the video, if you're only interested in certain parts, I'm going to leave timestamps in the description below so that you could, can say look at object the way I deal with the multiverse objection or God of the Gaps accusations or whatever ra rather than have to watch the whole thing. But I would prefer if you do watch the whole thing, that would be really nice. But I'm going to do that just for people who might be interested only in certain portions. And as you can see, I've got a new microphone, so hopefully the audio quality will be much, much better. Actually, no, no, actually the microphone's not new, but I've got a adapter so that I can now plug it into my MacBook Pro because before that I had an Acer desktop. I couldn't edit videos on it because it was too low specs, but it did have a microphone jack. The MacBook Pro did not. So we're going to talk about the fine-tuning argument today. The laws of physics actually provide good evidence for the existence of God, for the existence of design in the universe. So fire up those neurons, because we're about to use the brains that God gave us. Over the last 50 years, scientists have discovered that the laws and the constants of physics surprisingly conspire in a shocking manner to make the universe habitable for life. If the laws of physics were to be tweaked in just the slightest marginal way, the, if the laws of physics were tweaked in just the slightest marginal way, the universe would not be capable of supporting life of any kind. That's why it's called the fine-tuning of the universe. Just like on a radio, if you want a certain station to come in, you must tamper with the dial and tune it until the needle on the tuner is in the just right position. In the same way, the multiple different dials on multiple different tuners must be in very precise positions in order for life to be able to come into existence. In this video, I will I will discuss almost a dozen examples of this fine-tuning, then I will provide an argument for why intelligent design is the best explanation of that fine-tuning. And then after that I will examine a plethora of objections that atheists have lodged against the fine-tuning argument over the years. Examples of fine-tuning The Strong Nuclear Force this force is one of the four fundamental forces of nature. It's the force that binds protons and neutrons together inside the nucleus of all atoms. Just based on this alone, you can tell how important this force is for the existence of physical life. After all, everything is made up of atoms. My body, your body, and the body of every animal on this planet is made up of atoms. This computer I'm, t I'm recording on is made up of atoms, as is the desk it's sitting on. So if the fine-tuning argument were off by a little bit, it would have a devastating consequence on life. But just what specifically would go wrong? If the strong nuclear force were slightly weaker, it would not be strong enough to bind together protons and neutrons inside the center of atoms. This means that hydrogen would be the only element in the entire universe. Why? because the hydrogen atom has only one proton and no neutrons in its nucleus. It also has only one electron orbiting its nucleus. If the strong nuclear force were slightly weaker, it would be so weak that no protons would combine with any other protons and neutrons. Hence, single proton, single electron atoms would fill the cosmos. That is to say, the entire cosmos would only be filled with hydrogen atoms. Obviously, no life can exist in a universe like this. On the other hand, if the strong nuclear force were slightly stronger, it would be so efficient at binding together protons and neutrons that no hydrogen atoms could form at all. 
because for every proton, there would be other protons and neutrons sticking to them. In a universe like this, only heavy elements could exist. Hydrogen could not. Life chemistry is impossible if hydrogen either does not exist or is the only element in existence. What are the odds that the strong nuclear force should be fine-tuned for life? One part in 10 to the 30th power. That's a one followed by 30 zeros. One chance in a non-million that the strong nuclear force would fall into the life-permitting range. The weak nuclear force is example number two. This force is responsible for the radioactive decay of subatomic particles, and it plays an essential role in nuclear fission. If this force were any stronger, matter would convert into heavy elements at a pace too rapid for life. Any weaker, and matter would remain in the form of just the lightest elements. Either way, the elements crucial for life chemistry, such as carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus, wouldn't exist. How finely tuned is the weak nuclear force? One part in 10 to the 100th power. That's a one followed by 100 zeros, also known as a Google. One chance out of a Google that the weak nuclear force would fall within the very extremely narrow range needed for life to be possible. The next force is another of the four fundamental forces, and that is the law of gravity, or the force of gravity. The strength of the force of gravity determines how hot the nuclear furnaces in the cores of stars will burn. If this force were slightly stronger, stars would burn too rapidly and too erratically for life. This is bad because a planet capable of sustaining life must orbit a star that is both stable and long burning. On the other hand, if gravity were slightly weaker, Stars would never become hot enough to ignite nuclear fusion, and therefore, many of the elements needed for life chemistry would never form. Since these elements are essentially cooked inside the cores of stars, it's necessary that the stars be able to reach a certain temperature in order to synthesize them. A universe in which gravity were slightly weaker would be a universe in which no elements heavier than hydrogen and helium would exist. What are the odds that gravity should fall within the very narrow range to permit, prevent the above-mentioned effects? One part in 10 to the 36th power. Well, with a number as large as 10 to the 36, not to mention the previous numbers I threw out, it's hard to visualize this improbability. I'll need to give you an illustration to help you grasp how low these odds are. And in the film, The Case for a Creator, Lee Strobel gives a very helpful illustration. Let's watch. Imagine a ruler divided up into one inch increments and then stretched across the entire universe, a distance of some 14 billion light years. For the purposes of illustration, the ruler represents the possible range for gravity. In other words, the setting for the strength of gravity could have been anywhere along the ruler, but it just happens to be situated in exactly the right place so that life is possible. Now, if you were to change the force of gravity by moving the setting just one inch compared to the entire width of the universe, the effect on life would be catastrophic. The next force we want to look at is the force of electromagnetism. Astrophysicist Hugh Ross explains that, quote, if the electromagnetic force were significantly larger, atoms would hang on to electrons so tightly no sharing of electrons with other atoms would be possible. But if the electromagnetic force were significantly weaker, atoms would not hang on to electrons at all. And again, the sharing of electrons among atoms, which makes molecules possible, would not take place. If more than just a few molecules are to exist, the electromagnetic force must be del delicately balanced." End quote. The odds that the force of electromagnetism would be just right for life are 1 in 10 to the 40th power. The next force we want to look at is the ratio of the number 
of electrons to the number of protons. This must be finely tuned as well. If we had too many electrons, electromagnetism would overpower gravity, which would prohibit the formation of galaxies, stars, and planets. If we had too many protons, electromagnetism would also dominate gravity, which would also prohibit the formation of galaxies, stars, and planets. Either way, if we had too many electrons, or if we had too many protons, celestial bodies would never have formed. This is obviously bad for life, since if there are no galaxies, stars, or planets, then there's no home for life to live on. The odds of the universe's producing the just right number of electrons to protons is 1 in 10 to the 37th power. That's the number 1 followed by 37 zeros. One chance in 10 to the 37 is so improbable that it is hard to visualize. We need to, an analogy is probably going to be needed to help you grasp these numbers. And in his book, The, C the Creator and the Cosmos, astrophysicist Hugh Ross gives us an illustration to help us visualize this improbability. Ross writes, quote, One part in 10 to the 37 is such an incredibly sensitive balance that it is hard to visualize. The following analogy might help cover the entire North American continent in dimes, all the way up to the moon, a height of about 239,000 miles. In comparison, the money to pay for the U.S. federal government debt would cover one square mile less than two feet deep with dimes. Next, pile dimes from here to the moon on a billion other continents the same size as North America. Paint one dime red and mix it into the billions of piles of dimes. Blindfold a friend and ask him to pick out one dime. The odds that he will pick the red dime are one in 10 to the 37th power, end quote. That is a mind-blowing improbability. If your friend found the red dime, what would your conclusion be? That he found the red dime by chance? By accident? Or would you conclude that he purposefully searched for the red dime? I don't know about you, but I would conclude that my friend purposefully looked for the red dime. Not, he didn't find it by chance. Not, uh, not one billion continents of uh, the size of North America filled with coins stacked all the way up to the height of the moon and he's blindfolded and he picks out one dime and it just so happens to be the one red dime? No, that's not chance. That's design. The next force we want to look at is the ratio of electron to proton mass. It's not just enough to have the just right number of electrons to protons, but their mass ratio has to be just right as well. That is to say, the size of the electron relative to the size of the proton. If the mass of the electron or the mass of the proton were off by a little bit with respect to one another, then the bonding between chemicals would be insufficient for life chemistry. How finely tuned is this? One chance in 10 to the 37th power. Now, if you were gullible enough to believe that your blindfolded friend out of one billion continents worth of dimes, one billion continents the size of North America, filled with dimes, with the dimes stacked from the ground all the way up to the height of the moon, and you were gullible to, enough to believe that your blindfolded friend got the red dime by sheer chance on the first try, what would be, would you believe that he got it twice in a row? I wouldn't. I don't have that much faith in chance. Okay, so the next, the next finely tuned parameter we want to look at is the expansion rate of the universe. If the universe expanded too quickly, all of the matter would fly apart too rapidly for gravity to take it and condense it into galaxies, stars, and planets. In such a universe, no life would be possible. The universe would consist of nothing but isolated pieces of matter and gas. There'd be no home for life to live on. On the other hand, if the universe expanded too slowly, 
then gravity would have such a powerful pull on all of the pieces of matter in the universe that it would collapse in on itself. Why? Because in physics, the gravitational pull of two massive bodies attract one another, and the larger those bodies are relative to one another, and the closer they are together, the more powerfully they will attract. And when the universe is young, and therefore small, all of the pieces of matter in the universe will be tightly clustered together, and therefore gravity will cause the universe's expansion to slow down because all of the pieces of matter in the universe are being attracted to one another by the by gravity's pull but as the universe gets older and older and as it and therefore bigger and bigger all of the matter will gradually grow farther and farther apart as a result of the matter growing farther apart gravity's pull will grow progressively insufficient in its ability to slow down the expansion rate of, of the universe, while dark energy gets progressively more efficient as the universe expands. We'll talk about dark energy in a moment. Anyway, if the universe expanded too quickly, no galaxies, no stars, no planets would form at all. But if the universe expanded too slowly, the universe would collapse and we would still have no galaxy stars or planets either way if the universe expands too rapidly or too slowly galaxy stars and planets will not form and therefore you cannot have any form of life the late Stephen Hawking explains that quote if the rate of expansion one second after the Big Bang had been smaller by even one part in a hundred thousand million million the universe would have collapsed before it reached its present size." End quote. Next parameter, dark energy. Dark energy has to be finely tuned as well. Now what is dark energy, you ask? Dark energy is a type of energy, surprise, surprise, that is embedded in the very fabric of space. It's, in, it's an energy that is embedded in the very fabric of space itself. Okay, number one, how cool is that? But also, this energy is what drives the expansion of the universe. Actually, the expansion rate of the universe is governed by two forces. One is dark energy, and the other is gravity. Now, I think a good analogy to, to dark energy and gravity and its influence on the expansion of the universe is to compare it to a gas pedal and a brake pedal in a car. Uh, if you've got your foot more prominently on one pedal than the other, that will determine how fast your car is going. If you've got your foot more on the gas pedal, if more hardly pressed on the gas pedal, then your car will be going really fast. But if you've got your uh, if you've got your foot on the brake pedal, it's going to be going pretty slow. You, you may be, in fact, you may be still, depending on how much you've got your foot on the brake pedal. Now, as explained before, as I just said, the expansion rate of the universe is crucial to getting galaxies, stars, and planets. If the brake and gas pedals of the cosmos weren't finely tuned with respect to one another, either the universe would expand so quickly that, grav that all of the pieces of matter, gas, and dust in the universe would fly apart before gravity could condense them into galaxies, stars, and planets, or the universe would collapse because gravity would have too much of an influence on the expansion rate of the universe. So dark energy and gravity have to be finely tuned with respect to one another so that the expansion rate is happens at the just right speed. How finely tuned is dark energy? One part in 10 to the 120th power. That's 120 zeros after the number one. Now, Lee Strobel, in the Case for a Creator movie, gives this example to help us grasp how improbable this is. He says to, that the odds of dark energy being finely tuned are the same odds that if you flew thousands of miles into outer space and you turned around and threw a dart at the Earth and you just so happened to nail a target that is a trillionth of a trillionth of an inch in diameter. That is the width of a single atom. 
that's how that are that's that's how improbable it is that dark energy would be finely tuned in his book on guard william lane craig says that it's as improbable as taking a gun and firing it out into space and happening just happening to nail a target at the other end of the universe next parameter the entropy level of the early universe it's finely tuned to one part out of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123 that's 10 to the 123 zeros after the number one if you want to get an idea of how ridiculously huge this number is consider this if you set a laptop computer in front of a two-year-old toddler with Microsoft Word open and you told him to put his finger on the zero key until he had 10 to the 123 zeros typed in after the number one, how do you know how long it would take that child to type in 10 to the 123 zeros? He would die as an old man before he got finished typing all the zeros. In fact, if you replace the old man with another two-year-old toddler and told him to type in zeros in order to finish the work of his predecessor, he too would die as an old man before he got finished. In fact, you could go through ten generations of men spending their entire lives typing in zeros and you wouldn't be able to type this number out in full. This is an unbelievably gigantic number. In fact, when I first found this out in a physics textbook, my head nearly exploded. <laughs> That's not even counting the number of members in the collection of items that the written number is supposed to describe. The number of members in a collection of items is, it always outnumbers the number of zeros in the numeral that's describing the number of members in the collection. For example, the number 100 has only two zeros, but there are far more members in a collection of 100 items than there are zeros in the numeral 100. If you had a stadium of 1,000 people, there would be far more people in the stadium than zeros in the numeral 1,000. There are only two zeros in the numeral 100. There are three zeros in the numeral 1000. But in both cases, the number of members in the collection of items outnumbers the number of zeros in the numeral. So if there are 10 to the 123 zeros in the number, what would a collection of 10 to the 10 to the 123 items look like? To return to Hugh Ross's dime analogy, just how many piles of dimes would your friend have to search through to get the red dime? Well, remember how improbable it was for your friend to get the red dime out of 10 to the 37 coins? That was just 37 zeros. This is 10 to the 123 zeros. The odds that your friend should find the red dime out of a pile this size is trillions upon trillions upon trillions upon trillions upon trillions of times more improbable than the original dime illustration. What would happen if the what would happen if the entropy were any more or less in the early universe? Hugh Ross explains that, quote, if the rate of decay were any lower, galactic systems would trap radiation in such a manner that stars could not form. Starless galaxies would fill the universe. On the other hand, if the decay rate were slightly higher, no galactic systems would form at all. In either case, there would be no terrestrial ball to serve as a home for life." End quote. There are about 37 of these constants and quantities that must be precisely calibrated in order for life to exist in the universe. But for the sake of not making this video five hours long, I've only mentioned ten of them. 
Now, if you would like to learn more about the finely tuned constants and quantities and these specific examples, I recommend checking out Luke Barnes and Geraint Lewis's book, A Fortunate Universe, Life in a Finely Tuned Cosmos. It's available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle. Now, how is this extraordinarily fine-tuning to be explained? I think that the best explanation is that an intelligent designer purposefully tweaked nature's constants and quantities so that they would take the values that they did and therefore life could exist. To make this argument, I'll employ a syllogism that Dr. William Lane Craig uses in his books On Guard and Reasonable Faith. 1. The fine-tuning is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. 2. It is not due to physical necessity or chance. 3. Therefore, it is due to design. This is a logically valid syllogism. The rule of logic that this argument goes by is called disjunctive syllogism. Therefore, if the premises are true, the conclusion follows logically and necessarily. So are the premises true or are they false? Let's look at them. Premise 1 shouldn't be debatable. After all, it's just simply a list of explanations for what could account for the fine-tuning of the universe. How could anyone object to a list of possible explanations? The only objection that I could think that the skeptic could bring to premise 1 is that it's somehow not exhaustive. It doesn't list all of the possible alternatives, physical necessity, chance, or design. However, if he can think of a fourth alternative besides physical necessity, chance, or intelligent design, he's welcome to add it to the list and then we'll examine it when we come to premise 2. In other words, that objection would just simply say that we need to add another alternative to the list of possible explanations in premise 1. It wouldn't say that premise 1 is false. But, in the history of the debate of the fine-tuning argument, which has been going on for decades now, there's, these are the only alternatives that anyone has ever put forth. So the really debatable premise is premise 2, that it is not due to physical necessity or chance. Is this premise true, or is it false? The first explanation we need to examine is physical necessity. People who argue for this alternative argue that the universe has to, out of physical necessity, be life permitting. This seems far fetched to me. This alternative is an assertion that gravity couldn't have been stronger or weaker than it is, that the strong nuclear force couldn't have been more attractive or less attractive, that the weak nuclear force couldn't have been stronger or weaker than it is, that it was physically impossible that the universe expand any more rapidly or any more slowly. Any of these alternatives seems like they could have been different. And any of these alternatives, if they were tweaked, would have rendered the universe life prohibiting. So the person who argues that the fine tuning of the universe is due to physical necessity bears a very strong burden of proof. Unfortunately, for our skeptical friend, it's an extremely heavy burden of proof. Well, could it be the result of chance? I don't think so. Remember, Lee Strobel in the movie The Case for a Creator says that the odds of of get, even getting gravity finely tuned is like if you had a ruler stretching all the way across the universe from one end to another, a length of about 93 billion light years. And the and each of the inches represents the power strengths that gravity could have fallen on. And out of there's only one inch out of the entire ruler that is a life-permitting inch. And gravity just so happened to fall the, on that one particular inch. One inch out of the entire known universe. That is fantastically improbable. One chance in 10 to the 36th power, in fact. Now, later on in the movie, Lee Strobel says that if you combined the odds of gravity and dark energy, those two, just those two parameters together, 
the odds of those two parameters both falling into the narrow life permitting range would be the same odds as if you pick one specific atom out of all the atoms in the universe. Just one marked atom, one specific particular atom out of all of the atoms in the entire known universe. Hugh Ross, in his book, The Creator and the Cosmos, says that the odds of the just right ratio of electrons to protons being just right is one chance in 10 to the 37th power. And he said that the odds of this happening are the same odds as if you piled dimes from the ground all the way up to the moon on one billion continents the size of North America, and you painted one dime red mixed them into the billions and billions and billions of piles of dimes, blindfolded a friend, have him pick out the one red dime, uh, have him pick out one dime, and that dime just so happened to be the red dime. The odds of the low entropy level of the universe being just right is one chance out of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. This would be taking Hugh Ross's dime analogy and magnifying it trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of times. The scientist Roger Penrose says that the odds of our solar systems forming out of a random collision of particles is one chance out of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 60. Penrose calls this number utter chicken feed in comparison to 10 to the 10 to the 123. Each of these constants and quantities is statistically, imp is statistically impossible on their own, but when you multiply them all together, improbability is multiplied by improbability, by improbability, by improbability, until our minds are reeling in incomprehensible numbers. 1. The fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or due to physical necessity or chance. 3. Therefore, it is due to design. But, just as with the previous argument that we've looked at over the past four videos on the Kalam cosmological argument, we need to look at objections that atheists have typically raised to the fine-tuning argument to see whether it's as really as sound as it appears to be. Once again, I'll be looking at these objections in the specific order uh, of the premises that they attempt to refute. However, since, as I said, premise one is indisputable, it's just a list of alternatives, there really are no objections to it. So let's get to objections to premise two. Objection one, the multiverse argument. One of the most common responses to the fine-tuning argument is an appeal to the multiverse. What is the multiverse? Skeptic Martin Rees, who became a professor of astronomy at Cambridge in his 30s, illustrates it this way, quote, If there is a large stack of clothing, you're not surprised to find a suit that fits. If there are many universes, each governed by a different set of numbers, there will be one where there is a particular set of numbers suitable to life. We are in that one, end quote. In other words, our universe is just one in an infinite number of universes, and given the laws of probability, life is guaranteed to exist in at least one, and we happen to be in that one. So this theory gives chance a chance. Does the multiple universe theory really undermine the fine-tuning argument? No, I don't think so. There are four reasons why I don't think the multiverse makes chance a viable explanation. First, there's no evidence whatsoever that a multiverse even exists. No one knows if there are any other universes at all, much less an infinite number of them. There's no scientific evidence for a multiverse whatsoever. In fact, I don't even think there could be any evidence for a multiverse. It's not like you can hop out of one universe and into another. You can't see these other universes. You can't see them. You can't taste them. You can't smell them. You can't feel them. You can't hear them. You can't detect their radiation. You can't verify their existence in any way. So if the atheist wants me to abandon design as the best explanation for fine-tuning, he's going to need to provide some good evidence for the multiverse. Secondly, the multiverse has too much explanatory scope. 
I agree that if there is a multiverse, then it would certainly be able to explain the fine-tuning as a result of chance. The problem, though, is that it would enable you to explain away everything as a result of chance. You couldn't even infer design on the human level, much less the divine level. Imagine if you were playing a poker game with one of your buddies, and he got a royal flush seven times in a row. You would think he was cheating, right? Well, what if you accused him of cheating and he responded to you by saying, Well, I know it looks extremely suspicious that every time I deal I get a royal flush, but you've got to remember that our universe is only one in an infinite number of universes. There's an infinite number of poker games going on, so there's bound to be at least one universe where every time I deal, I get a royal flush. Would you take your friend's explanation seriously? Of course not. You would probably respond, you think I'm an idiot, don't you? You are clearly cheating. You could explain the existence of a Boeing 747 as a result of the multiverse. Maybe a tornado struck a junkyard and tossed a bunch of mechanical parts together until they formed a fully functioning Boeing 747. Yes, the odds of that happening are astronomically low, but hey, if there are an infinite number of universes, it's bound to happen in at least one of them, right? Oh well, no need to resort to an intelligent designer. Just imagine a defense attorney arguing, Your Honor, I know it's highly improbable, but I say chance chemical formation is the reason my client's fingerprints are on the weapon. That could be. After all, we live in an ensemble of infinite universes. It's bound to happen in at least one universe. If you were the judge, would you accept that explanation and acquit the defendant? I didn't think so. I could go on and on with examples of extremely improbable events that you could explain by appealing to the multiverse. The problem with the multiverse is that if you're going to consistently reject intelligent design in e on the basis of the multiverse, then you would have to reject an inference to design in every other area of life. Yet atheists don't do that. They only appeal to the multiverse to explain the fine-tuning as a the fine-tuning as a result of chance. Thirdly, Occam's razor favors design. Occam's razor is the scientific principle that says that if two hypotheses can both explain the data, then you should prefer the one that has fewer explanatory agents. In this case, we have one intelligent designer, as opposed to an infinite number of universes. Occam's Razor says that we should favor design over the multiverse theory. Fourthly, if the multiverse theory were accepted, it would destroy all grounds for rationality. As physicist John Kinson explains in his book, Does Mathematics Point to God? If an infinite number of universes exist, then every logical and physical possibility is actualized somewhere in the infinite ensemble. It is logically and physically impos uh, impossible for a Boltzmann brain to exist in at least one universe. So, therefore, if an infinite number of universes exist, there also exist Boltzmann brains. What is a Boltzmann brain? A Bolt named after the physicist Ludwig Boltzmann, Kinson explains that a Boltzmann brain, quote, is a brain that is the only existing thing in a given universe. The brain then imagines everything else within that universe. However, nothing that the brain imagines is real. Everything is just an illusion, a dream. The only thing that really exists is that one brain. There are no planets, no stars, no galaxies. No other matter or energy in that world other than the atoms that make up that single Boltzmann brain, end quote. Kinson went on to say that, quote, it takes less resources, energy, for the multiverse to create a Boltzmann brain than it does to create an entire 14 billion year old universe with 100 billion stars, end quote. And then John Kinson said that the ratio of the atoms in the human brain to the atoms in the universe is about 10 to the 26th to 10 to the 80th power. This is about 10 to the 54th power. 
This means that the multiverse could create 10 to the 54th power Boltzmann brains with the same amount of resources that it used instead to create our universe. John M. Kinson then went on to say that the number of Boltzmann brains is likely to be 10 to the 54th power times more plenteous than universes like ours. Therefore, if you accept the infinite universes theory, you must concede that Boltzmann brains exist. Moreover, there is a very good chance that you are a Boltzmann brain, and that the entire world around you, this room, uh, your room, this video, the phone or the computer you're watching it on, everything is just a projection of your own imagination. No sane person believes that they are a Boltzmann brain. Therefore, no sane person should accept the infinite universe hypothesis. If one thinks that it is abs absurd to believe that they are a Boltzmann brain, they ought to also think that the multiverse is absurd as well. And two. Well, we really shouldn't be surprised that the universe is finely tuned. After all, if the universe weren't finely tuned, we wouldn't be here to notice it. Given that we are here, we should expect the universe to be finely tuned. The objector is seeking to argue against the fine-tuning argument by appealing to the anthropic principle. What is the anthropic principle? The anthropic principle states that humans can only observe phenomenon in the universe that is that are compatible with our existence. Now, I think that this principle is obviously true. If there were features of the universe that were incompatible with our existence, then we wouldn't be here to observe them. But I don't think that this principle succeeds in undermining the fine-tuning argument. The fallacy of this argument is made evident by means of a parallel illustration. William Lane Craig gives this in, uh, illustration in his book On Guard. He writes, quote, Imagining you're traveling abroad and are arrested on trumped-up drug charges. You're dragged in front of a firing squad of 100 trained marksmen, all with rifles aimed at your heart to be executed. You hear the command given. Ready, aim, fire. You hear the deafening sound of the gun. And then you observe that you're still alive, that all of the 100 marksmen missed. Now, what would you conclude? Well, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that they all missed. After all, if they hadn't all missed, I wouldn't be here to be surprised about it. Nothing more to be explained here. Of course not. It's true that you shouldn't be surprised that you don't observe that you're dead, since if you were dead, you wouldn't be able to observe it. But you should still be surprised that you do observe that you're alive, in light of the enormous improbability that all of the marksmen would miss. Indeed, you'd probably conclude that they all missed on purpose, that the whole thing was a setup, engineered for some reason by someone, end quote. Do you get what Craig is saying? He's saying that even though we shouldn't be surprised that we don't observe that we're dead, we should be surprised that we do observe that we're alive. We shouldn't be surprised that we don't observe a life-prohibiting universe, since if there were a life-prohibiting universe, if this were a life-prohibiting universe, we wouldn't be around to observe it. But we should be surprised to that we do observe a life-permitting universe, given the overwhelming probability that the universe would prohibit us from existing. The anthropic principle only means that it's probable that we would observe a life-permitting universe. It doesn't mean that it's probable that a life-permitting universe would exist for us to observe in the first place. Objection 3. Any universe is equally as improbable as any other. This objection was brought up to me a long time ago in a Twitter conversation that I had with an atheist. Boy, the person I was talking to said, and this is an actual quote from him, 
quote, the fine tuning is like a game in which a blindfolded friend randomly picks a grain of sand from a huge beach. In this game, your blindfolded friend picks out one grain of sand, and the odds are trillions and trillions to one. Yet you wouldn't be justified in concluding he cheated and picked that particular grain on purpose, since any grain of sand is equally as improbable as any other grain of sand, end quote. I think it's clear that he's misunderstood the argument. Contrary to what a lot of people think, the fine-tuning argument is not trying to explain why this particular universe exists. Rather, it's trying to explain why a life-permitting universe exists instead of a life-prohibiting universe. I think a better analogy, and one that more accurately represents the fine-tuning argument, would be one in which you mix one grain of salt in with the trillions and trillions and trillions of grains of sand. Now even though any particular grain is equally as improbable as any other grain, nevertheless it is overwhelmingly more probable that whichever grain my blindfolded friend picks, it will be a grain of sand rather than that single grain of salt. In the same way, whichever combination of power settings the various laws of physics took, it was overwhelmingly more probable that it would have been one of the numerous life-prohibiting settings rather than a life-permitting setting. Objection 4. The universe isn't finely tuned for life, life is finely tuned to the universe. If these constants were different, then different life forms would have arisen. This argument says that if the laws of physics were to be stronger or weaker than what they are, then maybe we couldn't exist, we homo sapiens, but different life forms may have evolved. Often atheists I've talked to on social media have made use of the illustration by Douglas Adams, the well-known author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, although this quote is not from that book. Imagine waking up uh, imagine a puddle waking up one morning and thinking, This is an interesting world I find myself in. An interesting hole I find myself in. Fits me rather neatly, doesn't it? In fact, it fits me staggeringly well. Must have been made to have me in it. Richard Dawkins applied this to the fine-tuning at Adam's eulogy. Now, these atheists argued that just as that puddle is a fool, so we would be fools to believe that the universe is, was, is designed so that we could exist. The problem with this argument is that it radically misunderstands the consequences of what would happen if these constants and quantities were off by just a little bit. For example, I said earlier in this video that if the universe expanded too rapidly, rapidly then gravity would not have the opportunity to collect all the gas and matter and dust and condense them into galaxies, stars, and planets. Because if the universe expanded too quickly, then all of the stuff of the universe would fly apart too quickly for gravity to have a chance to take them and condense them into galaxies, stars, and planets. The universe would be completely devoid of celestial bodies. And if the universe expanded too slowly, then the universe would collapse in on itself before galaxy stars and planets could form. So, what kind of life could you have in a universe that doesn't have galaxy stars or planets? Floating space people? If the strong nuclear force were slightly weaker, it would be too weak to bind together protons and neutrons in the center of atoms. And in that case, the only element that would exist is would be hydrogen. How can life evolve in a universe where the only material thing is hydrogen? As you can see, the fine-tuning of the constants and quantities of physics greatly differs from the puddle in the hole. In other words, you could say that this objection doesn't hold water. Objection 5 most places in the universe will kill life instantly. Instantly! People say, oh, the forces of nature are just right for life. Excuse me, just look at the volume of the universe where you can't live. You will die instantly. Quote and end quote, Neil deGrasse Tyson. This is an objection that Neil De deGrasse Tyson has made to the fine-tuning argument. And while I was looking for... Um, for stock footage and videos 
to make this uh, YouTube video, I came across another, I came across a meme that worded this argument in a different way. The universe is not fine-tuned for life. The volume of the observable universe is four times 10, 1080 M3. The volume where life can exist, Earth, seas, surface, and atmosphere is 5.6 times 1019 M3. So the percentage of the universe where life can exist is 0 0.000000000000, a whole bunch of zeros, 14%. You call that fine-tuned for life? I would call the universe fine-tuned for life, only if that percentage was at least 3 million billion 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 times larger than it is. The universe is beautiful, but it will kill you at the first opportunity. This objection that Dr. Tyson and whoever made this meme puts forth goes to show that they don't understand the fine-tuning argument. Dr. Tyson and this meme maker are complaining that because many places in the universe can't support life, that this undermines the statement that the forces of nature are just right for life. A mere moment's reflection should show that Tyson and this meme maker have attacked a straw man. Advocates of the fine-tuning argument are not stupid. We are well aware that you cannot live in most places in the universe. Heck, we are well, well aware that we would die on the moon, Mars, Pluto, and heck, even several places on our own planet. The interior of a volcano, for example, doesn't make for good real estate. When we say the forces of nature are just right for life, we don't mean that you can live just anywhere or everywhere, or even most places of the universe. Rather, what the laws of physics fall within an extraordinarily narrow range which permit the existence of life. Were these parameters off by even a hair's breadth, life couldn't exist anywhere at any time in any form. For example, again, if the universe expanded too quickly or too slowly, the universe would have a total number of zero galaxies, zero stars, and zero planets. The ratio of the number of electrons to protons would also result in zero galaxies, zero stars, and zero planets if we had either too many electrons or too many protons. The strong nuclear force being weaker would result in a universe that consists of hydrogen and nothing but hydrogen. And this force being slightly stronger would resist in a uh, cons result in a universe that consists of no hydrogen at all. Tyson is attacking a straw man here. Tyson's argument is similar to saying that a house isn't designed to sleep in because there isn't a bed in every room. A house is certainly designed to sleep in even if only one room has a bed in it. The universe is finely tuned for life even if only one, or, a, or only a handful, of planets are suitable for it. And by the way, Tyson and its meme makers uh, comment highlights that there's much more that's needed to make life possible than just the parameters I've talked about in this video. In a future video, I plan on talking about what I call local fine tuning. But th these are things that are required to be just so in a localized region so that that localized region will be habitable. So you have both universal and local parameters that need to be fine-tuned for life to be possible. I think both are best explained by intelligent design. But let's look at two more objections, and any more objections that may be had against the argument I may address in future videos. This is an, we are now on to the objections to the conclusion of the argument that it is due to design. <clears throat> Objection one. This is a God of the Gaps argument. Actually, it isn't. You see, when it comes to the fine tuning of the laws of physics, there are only three possible explanations. Either the universe is finely tuned out of physical necessity, it's finely tuned as a result of an accident, or it's finely tuned because an intelligent designer purposefully tweaked the laws of physics and made them take that particular set of values. Those are our three options. Now in this video, we've ruled out physical necessity and chance. We've seen that those are not good explanations whatsoever. 
the physical necessity is just sheer conjecture. There's no reason to think that all of the values and uh, constants and quantities had to take the values that they did. Chance is extremely unreasonable. It's only hope is the multiverse, and we've seen that that is extremely problematic for four reasons. So, the only remaining option is design. This is not God of the Gaps reasoning. This is an inference to the best explanation. This is abductive reasoning. If you have only three possible explanations and you rule out option one and option two, you're not using option three of the Gaps reasoning. Imagine the following argument. One, the Flintstones takes place either in the past, the present, or the future. Two, it does not take place in the present or the future. Three, therefore, it takes place in the past. The first premise seems indisputable. It's simply a list of time periods when the Flintstones could have taken place. Uh, if the objector of the argument, if the detractor can think of another alternative, he's welcome to add it to the list, and then we can consider it when we come to premise two. But I can only think of these possibilities. So what about premise two? Well, premise two can be confirmed by looking at some evidence. For example, in the theme song, it describes the Flintstones as your modern Stone Age family. And we know that the Stone Age was a long time ago. A lot of the animals in the show have been extinct for millions of years. On the basis of these three pieces of evidence, the second premise seems pretty well established. It's not in the present or in the future, it's in the past. Now, would an atheist seriously say that this is past of the gaps reasoning? That you can't think of another time period and therefore you're just plugging the past into the gap in your knowledge? No, of course not, that would be stupid. The Flintstones argument is an inference to the best explanation. The fine tuning argument is also an inference to the best explanation. Now, in his book, Cold Case Christianity, I think that J. Warner Wallace gives a very good illustration of abductive reasoning. He says that he invites us to a dead body scene, because he's a, he's a, he's a homicide detective, or, and he said, <clears throat> Wallace says, deaths always fall into one of four categories natural death, accidental death, suicide, and homicide. Your job as a detective would be to figure out whether this is a homicide so that you can begin your job of tracking down suspects. If it's anything other than a homicide, you as a homicide detective would have nothing to do. Go home. <clears throat> Based on the fact that the man is dead and lying face down, you couldn't come to any conclusion on which of the four categories this death falls into. But suppose we add more information. This man is not only lying face down, but he has multiple stab wounds on his back. There's a knife sticking out of his back. He's lying in a pool of blood. And there's a set of footprints that lead away from the corpse. Now, on the basis of this evidence, we, could, we can determine what kind of death it was. This is not a natural death. No natural event is going to cause stab wounds to appear on a person's back, leave a knife sticking out, and cause footprints to lead away from the corpse. This isn't an accidental death, either. What, did the guy accidentally back into one of his kitchen knives over and over and over again? Why didn't he learn from his mistake the first time? Moreover, what about the footprints? Did this man go outside to smoke a cigarette before coming back inside, lying down on the floor and passing away? This is absurd! So, we've ruled out natural and accidental deaths. Well, what about suicide? This isn't likely either. If someone were going to stab themselves to death, they most likely would do it through their gut, like dishonored samurais did in feudal, in feudal times. And not to mention that suicide wouldn't explain the bloody footprints that lead away from the scene. So we can safely rule out suicide. So since the cause of death was not natural, accidental, or a suicide, 
we can therefore conclude that this vic this is a victim of homicide homicide is the only explanation left so it must be the right answer more not only that but homicide can account for every single fact at the death scene now you as a detective would laugh at anyone who accused you of committing homicide of the gaps reasoning oh you're plugging homicide into you're plugging murderer in the gaps in your knowledge because we haven't figured out we haven't figured out what caused this man's death so you're plugging murderer into the gaps in your knowledge that's stupid this conclusion is not based on what you don't know, but on the basis of what you do know. And the fine-tuning argument for design is the exact same way. The question we're going to look at tonight is... What if future discoveries prove that you're wrong? Some atheists, many atheists, have responded to this argument by saying, well, what if future discoveries prove that you're wrong? Maybe someday some scientific data will surface that will show that divine tuning is perfectly explicable without resorting to God. This argument does not refute this, this objection. It's not really a, an argument. This objection does nothing to refute the argument at all. In fact, it's merely a cop-out. This objection does nothing to explain the fine-tuning, rather all it does is bid us to wait for a non-theistic explanation to come along. This is what is known as the escape to the future fallacy. The problem here is that if this reasoning were carried out consistently, it would absolutely destroy science. This is because no matter how small, there is always a possibility that the current explanation might be overthrown by new data. Therefore, no hypothesis could ever be accepted. Theories replacing theories has happened throughout history. Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity replaced Newtonian physics, and Newtonian physics replaced Aristotelian physics. But I don't recall reading in any history books anyone went up to these scientists and said, hey, you're coming to your conclusion too early. Maybe future discoveries will prove you wrong. Imagine if someone said that to Albert Einstein. Hey Einstein, you can't say that general theory, uh, uh, general relativity is true. I mean, I know it looks like the evidence supports relativity now, but what if future discoveries show that you're wrong? Einstein would probably look at that person funny and say, Bro, do you even science? Can you imagine if this logic were carried out in a court of law? Judges could never send anyone to prison. Imagine a lawyer arguing, yes, your honor, I know that the evidence seems to indicate that my client is guilty now, but I think you're coming to your conclusion too early. We should wait. Maybe new evidence will prove that he's really innocent after all. Sometimes that does happen. Sometimes detectives find evidence years after the trial that proves that the defendant was really innocent all along. Here's the rub. If new evidence comes along in science, we abandon the current hypothesis. If new evidence comes along in law, we let the person out of prison. We need to follow the evidence wherever it leads now, not where it may or may not lead in the future. I hope you liked the video. If you did, smash that like button and subscribe if you haven't already and hit notifications. That's a little bell icon and you will be notified whenever I upload new content. So, until the next time, fellas, keep using the brains that God gave you.